up to camp one we were using crampons and we didn't have to use any fixed rope but beyond camp one there is the great crevasse and there we had to go down into the great crevasse put in one or two aluminium ladders across part of the crevasse and then fix rope to climb out of the great crevasse and into the neve above or rather the glacier above and beyond it just a few hundred meters to the camp 2 location and it was while we were trying to get down into the great crevasse that a sirac on which navang hilla and navang and i think uh, chao let's call him squad leader choudhury but person and i was belaying them with nima behind they crevasse broke away and they sort of almost fell hanging into the crevasse and uh, we managed to pull them back out again and went back into camp 1 because it's always an alarming and uh, nerve wracking experience to be left hanging in the mid air with a, even if you're ha- held back by a rope and so i remember chaus smile i say harry we almost had it so i said no this is normal the ropes are there so we next day we did the same thing this time i remember neema and i were leading and navang hilla was behind me and chaus was the end man belaying and this time we made it to the crevasse and we put the aluminum ladders and fixed rope to get up to the lip of the crevasse and on to establishing camp 2 after which the other relays of teams came up and the, the camp 2 was established after which there were normal crevasses which required some aluminum ladders and we were able to make it through the western coom into camp 3 which was at the foot of the south col and lotse face we used to look up at the southwest face southwest shoulder of everest where finally if you recall uh, the american expedition of which major harsh bhaguna was a part it was the international expedition led by the american mountaineer we just looked up at the south west shoulder and the glaciers and ice slopes below it and used to wonder whether anyone would ever be able to climb those up that route we were going by the route which has been successfully climbed by the british and attempted by the swiss the british had climbed it in 1953 and we went there in 19 62 i wonder if i got the date a year is right i i was given a rope this time with captain rd jungalwala of the army and i still had navangila porche with big tails sherpa from porche and nima from kumjum and jungle wala and i to we were asked to pioneer the route up from camp 3 to camp 4 from where the south call camp would be established by others so from camp 3 to camp 4 is going up the fairly steep but challenging but not very dangerous and not very difficult um, south call defile face to the western coom where the edge of it we were at the foot of it we were encamped in camp 3 there again it was a team effort jungle wala and i did our best
So we were able to establish Camp 4 and from there we Gurdayal Singh who had Suman Dubey with him and we managed to go through with two or three steps which are a bit difficult, required place where we had to fix ropes. We managed to reach the almost uh, spacious level playing field of the South Col which was covered with ice and astonishingly also with a lot of junk. We later on found two dead bodies on it. So we pitched our tents and on South Col and the South Col camp having been established, the relays began from base camp to equip South Col. And the day after we had established camp on South Col, Captain Kohli joined us. He was at that time the Deputy leader of the expedition. And John Dyers informed us on the walkie talkie that the first summit attempt would be led by the team of Captain Kohli, Gurdyal Singh, and Sonam Gyalzan. John Dyers, having decided that the first summit attempt team would comprise Gurdyal Singh, Sonam Gyatso, and Mohan Kohli. And the backup on the South Call would be provided by Hari Dang, Suman Dubey, and uh, one more member, and I think two Sherpas. We were in Jamais tents, French Jamais tents are long, elongated tents where you have two people on one side, two people on the other side, and it's a low, longitudinal tent, which is almost like a seven or eight meters, six or seven or eight meters long, and only one and a half meters wide, and about one and a half meters tall, high. But it was windproof and generally snowproof with a double fly. So in the morning we uh, had a fairly clear sky and we saw Gurdyal Singh, Mohan Kohli and Sonam Gyatsho start off very strong for the summit camp which they would have to establish at camp 6 or 7 at the altitude of roughly 27,000 500 feet whereas the south call would be would be about 25,000 6 700 feet i do not recall the altitude accurately as we watch them sitting on rocks outside our Jamet tents, the wind just starting to pick up from the east side of the South Col, which is called the, uh, this is the Kumbu face and that is the Kangshung face. It was the Kangshung face of Everest, uh, South Col. We saw the three going, climbing strongly, and then we saw them stop. And we saw one figure detach himself from the rope and start climbing down. And the other two sat down about 500 feet, maybe 800 feet above South Col. And we waited for them to come down and then the walkie-talkie was not functioning apparently up there too well and we found that it was Gurdayal coming down to the South Call and he came down to the South Call and breathlessly said, Hari, you have to go and take my place, I can't make it. So I said, no, I'm not ready for it. I've not my, you know, I haven't brought my extra clothing. I'm, normally I carry with me a lot of dry 
yuck meat and things like that. And I've, I've got nothing. I've just come to the South Call to see you people off and I'll be going to go back tomorrow with you or day after with you. So Suman Dubey said, no, no, you have to go. Hurry, you better go because it has to be a three. So finally we got through to John Dyer's on the walkie-talkie and he said, hurry, you go. Take over Gurudayal's place. So I quickly got ready my rucksack and my whatever I had, some extra socks and things, and uh, rejoined the other two, Sonam Gyatsho and Mon Kohli. And we made fairly good progress. The wind was high, but there was no sign of any blizzard or heavy snow. So we established again, this time not a Jame tent, it was a mead tent meant for three people. And we established this at, I think, at a height of about 27,500 feet on a fairly reasonable platform, which we leveled out a bit. And we had enough oxygen for the night. I was on the outer side of the mid exit side, and we use the camping gas, gas cylinder, make tea and boil water. And we slept in our sleeping bag very comfortably. And next morning we woke up to find there was a blizzard. And there was already a high wind, which was blowing the snowfall of the night away from us onto the southwest shoulder and the western coom. So there was nothing to be done, so we spent the day in our sleeping bags, listening to the buffeting of the tent flaps. And this went on for the whole day. So we actually spent the whole day and hoping that by the next day, that would be the second night, when it was over, the storm would have blown over. But as it happens, it did not. And we spent a second night, again in conditions of blizzard, in the same tent. But we found that our supplies of oxygen were running out. Because we had not planned to spend more than one night. Because the next morning we were supposed to have gone for the summit. As it happened, we spent three nights in that mid tent. And finally, on the fourth, the no, third morning, the skies cleared, the wind was just a whisper, and uh, there was very soon sunshine. So we quickly packed up and started off on our attempt for the summit, making good progress, looking both at the Kangshung face and at the this good face and we're going on towards the south summit of Mount Everest. And we were just below the south summit of Mount Everest when again the wind picked up, snow started falling and it seemed that we could not make the summit because the summit was still about, well, we were 100, 200 feet below the south summit and that means we were about six, seven hundred feet below the main summit, or five hundred feet below the main summit. So it was with a sense of regret, but also a sense of usual mountaineering reconciliation, we traced our steps back towards us, Camp 6, when the blizzard really overtook us. And it was a whiteout, we couldn't see anything. And we were going down, on a wide spur, but you could easily go too far to the east or too far to the west to be swept down both sides, either into the Kangshung face or into the Kumb face. And uh, it took us very long time to just make our way down and we couldn't then locate our tent because it was dark and we couldn't see and the blizzard was still blowing very intensely. 
And so it was then that uh, we sat down in the snow for a while to rest. And I remember uh, Sonam Gyatso saying, praying to his Buddhist gods and lamas, and Mohan Kohli saying, how nice and warm and cozy this is. Let's sit for a while. And I also said, yes, it's very nice and warm. We were suffering from hypoxia because we, our oxygen had been exhausted and we were without oxygen. So then I found myself as though coming out from a deep dive in a river or a pond to realize suddenly that we were suffering from hypoxia. This is where I think a schoolmaster tends to keep thinking. I always had this problem that I could never stop thinking. And uh, hypoxia would lead to an, and no, and hypoxia is the shortage of oxygen. The next step is the lack of oxygen. Anyway, I then, in a thin shout, you can't shout at that altitude, you can only speak thinly. It's a thin voice. I said, get up, get up. We've got to get up, otherwise we'll go to sleep here. And we'll never get up. So I remember tugging at the rope the, which, which held Mohan Kohli. Mo, Sonam Gyatsho was our anchorman. So Mohan Kohli was in front and I was in the middle. And uh, so I said, get up, get up. So Mohan Kohli got up saying, Hari, why are you bothering us? And he slipped towards the western coom face. And he dragged me with him, but I dug my the pick of my ice axe into whatever kind of uh, ice, hard ice, uh, soft, soft ice there was, and rock. And I didn't hold. I think I was going to go. We were both going down when good old Sonam Gyatso pitched his ice axe into a strong belay with a rope around it and held both of us. And we gradually made our way back to Sonam Gyatso and then we moved slightly eastwards and finding our way very carefully, we bumped into our tent and fell into it. Okay. This must have been at about nine o'clock at night. And we fell asleep, but. I had no oxygen at all and I was on the, again on the outer exit side of the meat tent and that's when I found that I had numbness of my feet and hands. So in the morning we managed to boil some ice into water and drank it and we dragged ourselves out and somehow walked down towards the South Pole and we were met by Two more Sharpas had come up and four Sharpas and Suman Dubey was there and Gurdyal was there. Who I remember all of us were helped by him. My feet were the most affected. Gurdyal, I remember that whole night kept on massaging my toes and my hands, which was very nice of him. And we had another group of Sherpas come up the next morning and they took us all down to Camp 3 and we didn't spend the night at Camp 3, we moved all the way down to camp, base camp that day and uh, with the hot soup and nourishment and Dr. Manuel Suarez and Dr. Ashok Nanavati as the two doctors, they looked after us and gave us various injections and so on. There was no edema, there was only frostbite. I, don't, I remember I was given Pris call and next morning the uh, uh, Harishwar Dayal, the, our ambassador in Kathmandu had been informed and he sent I think either one or two helicopters to Thiangbochi and I had to walk all the way down to Periche or was it Thiangbochi? to board the helicopter and we, we flown across to Kathmandu where we 
were met by Arshudayal and his wife Leela and uh, took a scheduled flight I think to Sabdajang airport. In those days Sabdajang aerodrome was the only aerodrome. Palam was a military airstrip and um, I think Mr. H.C. Sareen, Mr. S.S. Khera and one or two others were there. And uh, I was admitted to the military hospital in Delhi where they told me to stay in an air-conditioned room and not to allow my fingers which had turned like wooden sticks and toes which had become all black sticks hard not to let them be touched by water and this went on for almost a week and I spoke with Minister of Sport and Youth who used to be the mayor of Shamuni, uh, Maurice Hedzog who had frostbite on the summit of Mount Everest when she climbed long ago before us and he said come over here and I'll look after you, we'll look after you. So. I asked Mr. Sareen and other members and they said, well, we can't help you because you've got the military hospital. There was a Colonel Inder Singh who later on retired as Lieutenant General Inder Singh. They had no experience of frostbite at that time because the war had not started in Arunachal and Ladakh and Walong and Bomdila and Dagla. That started a little later. So they didn't know anything about frostbite. And I had a very difficult time on my own getting a passport, a visa and money because the government didn't give me any help to go to France on the basis of Maurice Herzog's help. I speak French a little bit. Then later on I became good at it. So I was able to go to Paris over the, on an overnight flat, flight and direct from there, I was helped by Maurice Hedzog and other friends who, of the French Alpine Club and the Club Alpin Francais and the Fédération Francaise de la Montagne of Mr. Lucien de Bees. And I was able to catch the Mistral down to Lyon, where the ambulance met me and took me to L'Hôpital Saint-Luc, where the first thing that I, they did was, before even I could get to the room, they took me to the clinic surgery of the hospital. It's not a Jesuit hospital, it's a Catholic hospital. And um, Dr. Pierre Colson and Dr. Hélène Janvier, the two doctors looking after me there, Colson was an experienced man in the, the Le Grand Brûlure and Frostbite, Gélure. So he said, bon, Put your feet and hands into hot water. After having been for two weeks told by the Indian doctors, do not touch your feet and hands with water. He says, otherwise you will lose your hands and feet. So I put my hands and feet in hot water. And after six hours, they became softer. And next morning and the day after that, they came off like gloves. And I've got my hand, the fingers of my hand are safe, the toes could not be safe. So they were later on, plastic surgery was done and all kinds of things and I was able to walk using electrically heated socks, which now I don't need. But then as age catches on, you find that everything goes wrong.